know, I, I, unfortunately, I know the screen's a little bit low, so I'm going to try to talk through if I've got something that's kind of down low. Having sat farther back in the audience during some of the earlier presentations, I realize this is a little tough to see. Um, I really, uh, I saw on the agenda that I only had about 20 minutes or so, and as many of you know, I can talk a lot more than 20 minutes, and so I really tried to pare down my, what I've got up here to, to go fairly quickly. So I'm going to put this map up and then uh, give you a little background. This is very similar to some of the maps you've already seen that Doug Yeager put up here. Um, this shows uh, water quality and uh, hydrothermal uh, alteration. And this gives you a sense up in the upper Silverton Basin as to where we have uh, really good water quality, where we don't have good, good water quality. The areas that are uh, purple are essentially areas that is, there's no aquatic life. That's where the worst of the water quality is. That includes Cement Creek in the upper Animus area. Um, and also Middle Fork of uh, Middle Creek. <clears throat> the area in red uh, is the uh, Middle Creek that also has very poor water quality. It's not quite as bad. Then you can't quite see the colors, but down lower here, you see this pointer works here. Uh, there we go. Down lower here in the lower animus, uh, we do have aquatic life. We've actually got to start to get a pretty good brook trout fishery. Uh, in the lower animus, although that water quality is not as, as good as it could be to protect all aquatic life. Um, there's also a little, uh, the water quality starts getting a little better in the lower part of Middle Creek. And then as we uh, have one of the presentations outside the Silicon Caldera, we have some streams that have very good water quality, like Cunningham Gulch. A little bit of background, uh, the Animus River Stakeholders Group, which I'm on the coordinating committee with, with Steve Barron and Bill Simon, we started in 1994, and the basis for our organization, which is actually not a formal organization, we're not incorporated or anything, it's just, it's whoever shows up as part of the Animus River Stakeholders Group. Um, we put together the organization because at the time, uh, EPA was considering uh, making most of San Juan County, uh, making it a super fun site, essentially. And there were a lot of people who felt like that wasn't the best approach to approaching water quality and that we could do better. Uh, at the same time, the Water Quality Control Commission, of which I'm currently chair, uh, had a hearing in Silverton to uh, potentially put standards on these areas up here. And a lot of people felt that the standards that they were going to apply were <coughs> way too stringent that they're unattainable standards. And so, and really, nobody had that much information. As, as we've had already, you understand that, that there's been a lot of scientists doing a lot of work up here, uh, collecting a lot of information. And back in 1994, none of that was available. Nobody had any of that information whatsoever. And we had some people who felt like most of the uh, water quality issues were all related to mining, and we had other people who thought they were all natural, and there was absolutely nothing you could do about any of them. And we, pretty quickly found out, sitting around in the table together, that uh, nobody had the answer. Nobody really knew the information. And that's kind of where the whole process began. And we had to start collecting information. And we felt like it was a lot better if we all sat at the same table and collected that information together so we didn't argue over the information as opposed to having one party hiring its consultants and another group hiring its consultants and then everyone spending a bunch of money and having them argue in front of the judge. That didn't seem like a very good idea to us. So we spent quite a bit of time uh, looking at uh, all the different mine sites up here over the past um, 15 years or so. Uh, various entities have sampled that have been part of the Amherst Stakeholders Group have sampled probably about 200 draining addits or only 200 draining addits and about 200 waste rock piles. And we made some uh, best professional judgments about what could, well, how much metal could we reduce from those sites? And where would that get to us in terms of water quality? We didn't have the advantage of proper on those models trying to figure out uh, that, that kind of the more geochemical aspects of when you do some treatment in one place, what are you going to get somewhere else? We just said, well, we think we can get this much out. That's kind of our best guess. And this is the standards we think we're going to get. Back in 2002, after doing a lot of work and putting together a large study on the use of sustainability analysis, we developed some water quality standards that we thought were potentially attainable. 
And uh, we worked before the Water Quality Control Commission, and they adopted those standards, and those are the standards that are in place today up here in so called there. So, in more recent times, we've been looking much more closely at water quality data um, now that we have all the lot more information that we didn't have 20 years ago. And uh, now we have about a 20-year record. And so I think it's, it's kind of time to see how we're doing, and see where we are. Uh, this is at Minnow Creek. So this is down, this is a gauging station down here at the mouth of Minnow Creek, uh, kind of where the highway comes across the, the uh, creek there. And uh, there's been a lot of remediation up at Upper Minnow Creek. Um, Sunnyside did quite a bit of work up there. The Inland Service Stakeholders <coughs> did a number of projects. The Forest Service did several remediation projects up there as well. Most of those projects were done up at the headwaters of Mineral Creek. We're looking at the water quality all the way down at the bottom of Mineral Creek. This is uh, zinc concentrations. The top line, this uh, top line is the zinc concentrations back in 1992-95. The next line down, this yellow line, is zinc concentrations in 2006 to 2010. And then the red line is the standard. 2006 well this is the standard on mineral creek this red line here and you can see we're getting pretty close to it that was our estimate this red line was our estimate back in 2001 of where we thought we might be able to get to the yellow line is where we are today and there are several sites that still like to do some passive treatment on some draining mines in that area or up in mineral creek and we're unable to do so because of this good samaritan liability that you'll hear most of you know quite a bit about, you'll hear some more a little later. But so there are several other sites that we'd still like to do. We've done most of the ones up there we like. And so in this case, it looks like this zinc concentration may be attainable. These lines don't look very far apart, but when you start looking at the numbers, it's about a 50% re zinc reduction. So it's a pretty substantial reduction in zinc in Mineral Creek. Here's copper. Same kind of graph. Uh, here's back in the early 90s what copper concentrations were looking like. These are, by the way, uh, months down here in the bottom. The reason why there's that huge dip in the middle is because of spring runoff. That has to get a lot more dilution, so the concentrations drop way down. So that's why we've got that big dip. And usually we get the highest concentrations kind of in uh, early spring. That's usually when the water is the most toxic for aquatic life. For copper, um, We've seen a huge reduction, and actually this uh, yellow line down here at the bottom is copper 2006-2010. We're actually essentially meeting the standard that we thought was feasible back in uh, uh, 2001. So, for copper, we've got almost a 70% reduction. Iron. Iron hasn't changed much. Iron in uh, this, these, two, these two lines here that are kind of intertwined, the, the red and the yellow lines, those are iron concentrations in uh, the early 1990s and then iron concentrations in 2006 to 2010. <coughs> they haven't changed much. And that's actually something that we thought was going to happen. We didn't think we could get much reduction in iron because most of the iron does not come from mining sites. It comes from that few sources. Uh, here was our prediction of the standard. We actually haven't gotten that close in the, the spring runoff. We're getting below it. Uh, but this is something we may have to revisit, that the iron standard may not be appropriate. Zinc, this is at uh, what we call A68. This is the Animus River um, above Cement Creek. The gauging station is right here in the bridge that you cross to get to this facility. And in that particular place, um, the top line, again, is the uh, zinc concentrations in the early 1990s. And we had this really high peak that we see all the time at the beginning, at uh, late in uh, early spring, before the spring runoff really got going. And we felt what was happening is we were getting a lot of snow melt running through the waste rock piles. And so we were getting this kind of early flush of metals before there was enough dilution to kind of knock down the concentration. And we had this very high peak. Um, there's been a lot of uh, remediation done up there, mostly by Sunnyside, mostly of uh, a lot of mine dumps up there, and it's knocked that peak down. 
here in uh, this red line, uh, which has, still has a peak, um, is what uh, we're getting to today. And the green line, which you find follows very closely to it, is the standard that we estimated back in 2001. We're doing pretty well. We're almost right there. This last line down here at the bottom, I know you in the back can't see, that's the uh, what we call the table value standard. That would be if you want to project all aquatic life in that particular segment. And we never felt like we could get to that level. <clears throat> However, there is a pretty good brook trout fishery, and it's definitely gotten better in that stream segment. Uh, copper, uh, kind of similar thing. We had this uh, high peak that, that in the early 1990s. That peak has been knocked way down, this red peak. And actually, in this case, this is the table value standards. This uh, blue line, which we're almost meeting, so we're almost meeting standards to protect all aquatic life for copper. Uh, cement creek, a different story. This, these two lines down here are the early 1990s, um, and also, uh, well, these are all early 1990s. And then this line that's really high, this big V in uh, blue, is what we have today, 2006, 2010. There's been a tremendous increase in zinc concentrations coming down from cement creek. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Let's see, that also, this is uh, zinc concentrations at A72. That's a gauging station below Silverton, below Mineral Creek, and below Cement Creek. And in this case, the zinc concentrations, this top line is 2006 to 2010. That's the highest one. So zinc concentrations actually in the animus have gotten worse below Silverton. We've gotten gains in Mineral Creek. We've gotten gains in the upper animus, but that's been more than offset by the decline in cement creek. Um, and we're fairly far from the standard in, in the animus below Silverton. Uh, Baker's Bridge, I'm not going to put up a graph, but there's been a, an increase in metal loading over the past five years at Baker's Bridge. That's down here in Hermosa. Uh, right now, there's exceedances of water quality standards for uh, chronic lead, cadmium iron, and acute zinc. So aquatic life standards are being seeded down there um, a little ways north of Durango. We've occasionally got some high lead concentrations as well during the flow, which is really, we don't understand that. We don't know where that's coming from. By the time you get to Trimble Lane, which is halfway between Hermosa and Durango, all aquatic life standards are being met, water quality standards are being met down there. So it's really the Animus Canyon is where we're seeing a lot of problems in terms of water quality uh, between Silverton and Baker's Bridge. We have some biological data from that area as well, and it tells us the same thing. The biological data, there was a 2010 fisheries report where the DOW went and sampled fisheries, electroshock from the Amos Canyon, and uh, they did in 2005 and they did it in 2010. In 2010, there was a substantial decrease in the number of fish and the number of species in the canyon. So the water quality and the biology correspond. We also had a macroinvertebrate report where people sampled macroinvertebrate, the bugs on the bottom of the streams. Same thing, in 2010, the number of bugs and the diversity of bugs had declined substantially from 2005. So we're seeing the same thing biologically as we're seeing chemically in the water chemistry. Um, Upper Cement Creek. Uh, many of you kind of know some of the situation up there in Upper Cement Creek. Um, Sunnyside Gold stopped uh, mining up there in 1991 as part of their reclamation plan. They put in uh, bulkheads in the American Tunnel to reduce the amount of water coming out. Then they also did a tremendous amount of remediation all through the basin to offset any seeps and springs that might occur. In about 2002-2003, um, Sunnyside and the state came to agreement that they had done everything that they were supposed to do under the consent decree. They signed off, the state signed off on the consent decree, saying, yes, you're, you're free and clear now. Um, and right around that time, we started seeing greater drainages, uh, greater amounts of water coming out of four, well, three other drainages up there in Upper Cement Creek. 
Uh, those ranges have increased uh, substantially since about 2002-2003. Probably around 2006, those ranges kind of stabilized. And now between the, uh, the Red Bonita, the Gold King number 7, the Mogul Mine, and the residual that's still coming out of the American Tunnel, we have about 600 to 800 gallons per minute of um, acid mine drainage that's coming out untreated. And that was not, we did not consider that when we were looking at water quality standards back in 2001. And that's had a substantial impact. <clears throat> um, this is probably the last graph uh, diagram I'm going to put up. This is kind of something that will give you a little bit of a sense of the amount of volume of zinc that comes from different sources. Um, these are, uh, these numbers are pretty rough. You know, and some of them we pin down a little bit better than others, but this will kind of give you a sense. When we're looking at zinc here. Zinc is a primary metal concern, but there are other metals that we're also concerned with as well. But, but kind of, if you, if you were able to get a handle on the zinc problem, you probably end up getting a handle on most of the other issues as well, most of the other metals. At A72, down um, below Silverton, there's about 241,000 pounds of zinc that goes by every year. At the mouth of Cement Creek, about 120,000 pounds. So that's about half. Uh, most of the rest of it comes down, actually comes down the Animus, and then a smaller portion down the Mineral Creek. The Animus has so much higher flow that there's a lot of dilution. So the concentrations aren't that high in the Animus, and thus we have water, better water quality, and we have uh, brook drought. The four large discharging addicts in Cement Creek that I mentioned before, they put about, uh, about 57,000 pounds of zinc per year. So there's still a lot of metal coming down Cement Creek that's not coming from the four atoms. And some of those are maybe some of the mine sites, but there's also a lot of groundwater that carries a lot of zinc as well. Then here's some loading estimates that we made back in 2001 to kind of give some perspective. The Kohler Tunnel is also a huge discharger of zinc as well, 29,600 pounds per year. So that's actually by itself is a little bit bigger than probably any one of these four drainages by themselves. Kohler was a huge zinc discharger. There's currently a bulkhead in the Kohler tunnel. And there's also this uh, past summer or last summer, uh, ARSG sponsored a grouting project to grout the area around that bulkhead and try to further seal what's coming out of the Kohler tunnel. This summer we'll have a better sense of how well we did. But there's, so a lot of this zinc has been removed. We don't expect to see that coming out in other places. So we're hoping not. Other estimates that we made back in 2001, of the top 32 mine waste piles in the basin, so out of about 200, we had 32 that we took a look at that we thought were the, the worst ones that needed some work. We estimated only about 16,600 pounds would come out of those mine waste piles. The top 32 draining addicts, not including the Kohler, this was before we had these drainages, we estimated there was about 28,300 pounds of zinc coming out of other sources. Then finally, these are very rough. Uh, we, have, we have the numbers, but it's taking a while to go through them and get, get better, uh, uh, better estimates here. But of the other 160 draining addicts of the sample, we may only have about 6,000 pounds of zinc coming out of those. So there's an awful lot of addicts up here that aren't doing much damage. Of the other 160 mine waste pile sample, it might only be maybe 1,700 pounds of zinc coming out of those mine waste piles. So there's still, the point I want to make here is that there's a substantial portion of zinc that's coming from a number of sites, but there's also a substantial amount that we can't attribute to mining areas, probably a little more than half we can't attribute to certain mining areas. And, you know, so you're probably not going to get those metal reductions in those areas. Even though you get, there's a lot of metals coming out of some of these mine sites, you may not be able to get much reduction in some of those sites either. They're just too inaccessible and it's too expensive to do so. But our main focus currently is um, these four uh, discharging addicts. And uh, hopefully with those, by addressing those addicts, we can get some fairly substantial reductions uh, down there at A72 in the end. So I'm going to end there. I think people are getting ready for a break.